Hello, everyone, and welcome. As many of you already know, my name is Keshet Rahman, and I am a reference librarian and the head of adult programming here at the Irvington Public Library. Unfortunately, we still can't let patrons into the building just yet, but we are working towards determining a date for that. So stay tuned to our email newsletter, website, and social media channels. With us today is Donna Rubin, who's going to be presenting Women in the Rivertown Speak Out. I'm going to hand things over to her now and shut off my audio and video. We ask that anyone who has any questions or comments, once again, please keep them to the chat or wait until Donna has specifically asked for audience comments or questions. Thank you. Kishat, thank you. And thank you to the Irvington Library. I'm so delighted to be here speaking and I appreciate you Kishat specifically because well, for people who don't know, Gachet is a librarian and she's been so helpful to me with my research, getting me books that I need, getting me books through interlibrary loan. The whole library staff has been very helpful to me over the past few years while I've been doing this research. And it is, as everybody researching historical subjects know, you really need the good support of uh, research staff and I'm indebted to you. Thank you for joining me today. And I'm particularly happy to see Laura Seaman here. Laura, I think you were at my very first talk. So let me, uh, so now you can be at my very last, the last talk that I'm giving of this nature. I've been working for a couple years now on a project to two plus years to revise the history of speech or oratory to include women's voices. It sounds like a big project and it is a big project. And I. I'll explain to you why. I have a PowerPoint I'm going to share with you in a few minutes. But I do want to say that I, over the last two years or so, two years plus, I've been giving some talks in the River Towns because I live here in Irvington. And um, I think the first one I gave was at the White Plains Library at least two years ago, and Laura was there. So Laura, now you're in a position to see, this is the last one that I'm giving. You're, you're in a position to see the trajectory of the work that I'm doing. And my goal for today is to explain to you my project um, briefly, an overview, talk about some really remarkable women in our neighborhood, in our backyard, who used their voices publicly to speak out for causes that they believed in, and then to ask some questions, some large questions about where ideas come from and where, um, where we get the moxie the bravery the resolve to raise our voices and speak out about issues we care about and so i think that um i don't have the answers i'm asking questions more than providing answers but i do hope that we'll have an opportunity to discuss these things because i want to know what what you guys think and i'm really eager to learn from from all of you too okay so let me share my screen we'll get started Slideshow, what am I doing wrong? Slideshow, play from start, there we go. Okay, women in the river towns speak out. This is, um, as I said, this is my project. All the images here that you can see are images of women from our neighborhood. Um, women that some of them you'll recognize and some of them I'm, I'm guessing you won't recognize, but they're all Westchester women. So if I would ask you, just to think of who comes to mind as a powerful speaker, who might you name? And uh, just a powerful speaker in history. And generally speaking, people mention men, people come up with men because an image of a power sp powerful speaker is usually a man. Of course, we have Abe Lincoln, Winston Churchill, JFK, um, MLK, Ronald Reagan. They are among the stalwarts of every, um, anthology, every list, everybody's um, go-to reference for powerful speech. And I began to ask myself um, and to look around the world and ask uh, of the larger world, where were all the women speakers? I'm a longtime speech writer and speech coach, and I wanted to know, surely women have been speaking in history, where were these women's voices? So I started looking at anthologies. These are compilations or collections of women's speeches. And I got a bit 
obsessive because I am obsessive. And I started looking at one after another, after another. In fact, I looked at 230, <laughs> 230 of them. A lot of them were old. You can see from the cover, they're old volumes. Some of them were from the 19th century. In fact, the earliest one was from 1797, but some of them were new, great speeches of our time. And almost to a, you know, to one, there were no speeches by women or very few speeches by women. Great modern speeches, rhetoric for the ages, are the men, where are the women? So this is the question that I asked myself. And I put all of these books, every one of these little boxes in the left-hand columns are covers of anthologies. I know you can't see them, so that's why I provided a close-up. How the history of speech forgot about women's speech. The forgot is supposed to be <laughs> implied uh, parenthetically parentheses, meaning I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but women have been speaking up through the ages. You would never know it from looking at the speech collections. And so you can see that all those navy blue boxes are collections that had no speeches by the women. And I'm gonna go back and show you the larger infographic. You can see towards the bottom, there's some green, the green or the women's speeches. But in general, when people talk about the history of speech and they collect the world's best speeches, they just ignore women. Why? Well, since the beginning of, really since the beginning of recorded history, we've talked about male speakers, but not a lot about women speakers. And of course the classic, um, the classic period of oratory, the ancient world um, gave us our model for rhetoricians. And this is Cicero, a uh, Roman statesman and, and rhetorician. So when I started looking at these anthologies, I would see things like this, um, a book of oratory, the Art of Speaking Well, a book of oratory with the figure of a man. American orators and oratory, biographical sketches of the representative men of America, and a treasury of great American speeches, our country's life and history in the world's words of its great men. So again, I ask, where are all the women? Well, here they are. This woman is, I'm laughing, but it's not funny. A woman being punished for being a common scold. Uh, this book is not from 1834. It's from this, I think it's from the 17th century. A scold. A scold is a woman. A scold is never a man, right? A scold is a woman who scold, is the, scolds you. You don't like what she's saying. And this one, poor woman is getting dunked in the river. It was a common punishment. There was something called a dunking school. Dunking uh, stool as they would punish women by dunking them in the river. This woman is wearing the branks, the scolds guard. It's like a um, chastity belt, an iron cage over her head. She's chained to the post behind her. She's being publicly humiliated and punished for speaking, for saying things that the public didn't want to hear. So she's um, being punished for her speech. And then, of course, I've got these a whole series of postcards. They are gruesome. I'm only going to show you a few. This woman's head is in a clamp. It's a different kind of a scolds guard, but obviously she's nagging. You've got if you've got a wife that nags, get one of these patent gags. I got a little obsessed, as I do with everything, and I looked for these postcards. These are all images of postcards. A lot of them were popular. Uh, during the golden age of postcards, which was around the turn of the century, 1870s to 1910 or 20, around the time that women around the world were pushing for their rights and the right to vote. And of course, there was a backlash in the form of um, hor horrific images against women for speaking, getting their tongues cut off, peace at last, the end of World War I and peace at last, if the woman would just shut up. This poor woman's got a bolt against her mouth and this one's got a cage. Okay, enough. I have like 130 of these images. I told you I get obsessed, but they're grotesque. So moving right along, I set up a website called Speaking While Female, speakingwhilefemale.co, not .com.co, but I hope after today's talk, you'll go and look at it because I have thousands of speeches by women. I just started looking them up in the history books, in the archives, in the out of print books, in the old newspapers, collecting women's speeches and putting them on this website. And many of them are historic speeches that 
brought new ideas into the world, introduced new ideas, new policies that pushed the limits on what we were thinking and introduced new ways of thinking about ideas, women have used their voices throughout history. And I'm talking back to the Roman era. I had the earliest speech, I think, is by Hortensia in 42 BC. So women have been speaking. It's just that the gatekeepers, the publishers, the people who keep those lists weren't very interested in what women had to say. So I'm going to talk today about some women here in Westchester, women right here in our backyard, but I'm going to go through them pretty quickly because I want to leave time at the end to ask, as I said, some larger questions. But I'm going to start with Deborah Sampson, Deborah Sampson Gannett. She was a remarkable woman from Massachusetts who during the Revolutionary War period, wanted to enlist and fight alongside her fellow soldiers. So she dressed up as a man and went down to the recruitment station and they could see right away she was a woman and they kicked her out, but she persisted. She went back and this time she succeeded and she enrolled enlisted with a regiment in Massachusetts. And this was at the very tail end of the Revolutionary War and she saw battle. She went into battle and she was wounded she was hit by a musket in the head, grazed her head, and she had two musket balls in her leg. One of them she pulled out by herself. She extracted by herself. She didn't want to go to the hospital, but they would find out her that she was a woman. Anyway, she was extremely brave. She took part in some skirmishes um, in our area in the Battle of Terrytown. That that's her. That was her name when she enlisted Robert Shirtliff. So that's her signature. Um, but here is Terrytown. Ossining is to the left, so that's to the north. Uh, to the right is New York City. And so um, this is just a map of the area, of the era, 1781. The Battle of Terry, Terrytown took place in a number of places, and we don't exactly know, historians aren't exactly sure where uh, she was injured. It might have been here or sort of elsewhere in the county. But she did go down to the Philadelphia area where she was injured again and taken to a hospital and then the gig was up. She was discovered to uh, be a woman dressing as a man and um, so she left the army anyway the war was coming to an end and she did something remarkable something remarkable she published an autobiography a book about her experiences and she went on the lecture circuit so in 1804, she spent the whole year traveling around the Northeast speaking in public about her experiences of the war. And this is a theater, a very famous theater in Boston, the Federal State Theater, where she spoke four times in May 1804. She, um, Deborah Sampson Gannett was the first paid American female speaker the first woman to speak in public on a stage and get paid for it as a public speaker to say, I'm a public speaker, I'm making a living off of it. And that puts her in, that alone was a remarkable thing. She would come out and she would recite her oration about her experiences. And then she would leave the stage and come back all dressed in military gear with her musket and move through her movements, her musket movements. Um, and I have a copy of her speech on my site, as I do, with the exception of one woman, all of the women that I'm going to be talking about today. So Deborah Sampson Gannett. Oh, here's a post, a billboard from her, an address delivered with applause at the Federal State Theater in Boston. Four successive nights of the different plays beginning March 22nd, 1802. Okay, big hero of mine. There's her, her John Hancock, Deborah Gannett. But as as her real name, not, not her assumed name. Sojourner Truth. You, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with her name. Many people don't know, she spent a considerable amount of time right here in Ossining. She was a remarkable, remarkable woman who grew up in Ulster County and um, escaped slavery, left, and she was an enslaved woman. I think she was bought and sold five times by the time she was 15. I mean, it was really, terrible, terrible um, experience for her. But she left on her own accord. She walked away with her child. She went to New York City. She joined a family. She worked as a domestic for a family, a, a housekeeper for a family. And she became very religious. 
this family was very um, evangelical and she moved with them to an evangelical community right here in Ossining. It had a, a leader, a charismatic leader, Matthias was his name. And I can tell you exactly where it is if you wanna know. It's really south of where the prison is, more of Scarborough area, but right off of the Boston Post Road, right off of Broadway. But Sojourner Truth was really remarkable because while she was there, she experienced the evangelical calling of the Lord. She changed her name to Sojourner Truth because she was sojourning to the truth. Uh, her name before was Isabella Bonfrey. So now she was Sojourner Truth. She traveled all over. She had a really a peripatetic life. She moved around and spoke about women's rights, about religion, about the calling of the Lord and about slavery, abolition. So she was a speaker and she was a paid speaker. She would, in many places she spoke for free, but she also charged for her speeches and she would sell these pictures. This is like a carte de visite. See, it says, I sell the shadow to support the substance. The shadow means, is a reference to photography because it was made with light and dark. She sells these images to make money for herself to support her Sojour her sojourner's experience, her sojourning, so she can talk about abolition, women's rights, and religion. And you can see also in this image, her right arm, she was disabled. She had, I don't know whether she was born with it or she had an injury, but her right arm was disabled. So she often held it up to her, her chest like that. She was an extraordinary woman. Oh, and here's a free lecture by Sojourner Truth who has been a slave in the state of New York. She was an extraordinary woman who used her voice. She was extraordinary in her, in the force of her voice and in her, her farsightedness, her hu humanity, the way she spoke out for so many people who did not have rights. Um, I think she was just also stunning looking. And I'm gonna, she was one of the most photo photographed people in the 19th century. And I'm going to share with you now, I hope you can hear this. I have a recording. This is not of her actual voices. This is of a woman of Arlene McGuire reading Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech, but it's not that version. It's a version that historians think is closer to the truth, closer to what Sojourner Truth actually said. And it's read by our, uh, a great um, voiceover artist named Arlene McGuire. May I say a few words? I want to say a few words about this matter. I am a woman's rights. I have as much muscle as any man and can do as much work as any man. I have plowed and reaped and husked and chopped and mowed. And can any man do more than that? May I okay, I was only gonna play a short excerpt, but what, what I think is not right about that excerpt is that you don't hear the Dutch accents. Sojourner Truth grew up in an area where low Dutch was spoken. And obviously that sounds a little more Southern than it does Dutch, but the cadences and the rhythm of her, of her voice are beautiful. This is Sojourner Truth's signature. She was illiterate all her life, meaning she couldn't read or write, but um, she twice took white men to court in court of law and won against them twice. Once it was a property dispute and once was to get her son back because her son had been taken from her. And she also twice bought and sold property, which is more than I can say about myself. So quite a remarkable woman who, um, who left a huge mark on the world. Eliza Farnham, another woman who made her mark here in our neighborhood, she was in our part of the world. She also was a remarkable woman, um, not from here. I think she was from Massachusetts, but she came, she was a reformist and she came here to be the woman's warden at Sing Sing, at Sing Sing prison. Oh, I'm around the corner from the library. So you can hear all the audio that anybody in the library can hear. You can hear the train going by <laughs> the, on, the, on the train tracks below my window. So excuse that sound, Eliza Farnham, she was the woman, woman, I think she was the first woman's warden at Sing Sing. 
And she brought all kinds of reforms there. She brought in a library. She was much kinder and more lenient with the women. She brought in, she allowed for, diff, for more liberal visitation rights. She brought in a lot of reforms to, to the women's, to the women prisoners at Sing Sing that were quite advanced for her age. She also relied heavily on phrenology, which is the study of skulls or, or um, head shapes, the size and shape of head, because it was believed that that could determine a lot about a person's proclivity towards crime and their ability to reform themselves. So we don't think that anymore. Obviously that's outdated, but in other ways, she was very farsighted. Later, she left that job. She wasn't, her ideas weren't received too kindly. She was there for about three or four years at, at Sing Sing. Later, she went to California. She spoke. I have not yet been able to find any of the speeches she gave, but she spoke about um, women and independence. She went and inherited a farm and, and that was a flop, but she spoke about her experiences there and wrote several books about her experiences. And I have a speech in my archive about that Eliza Farnham gave in Vermont um, about, um, well, about women's rights, about the women, the right of women to vote and be um, self-determined. Here's an early picture of Sing Sing. Conditions were really brutal there. They forced all the prisoners to march tight, connected to one another in lockstep. It was, it was really horrific. You can see the river in the back there. Okay, Fanny Garrison Villard. Some of you must be familiar with Villard Street here in, um, it's in Hastings. Now, I happen to walk Villard sometimes in the evenings and it goes, straight up, it's good exercise to walk up Villard Street. And only recently did I make the connection between the fact that it goes straight up in Fanny Garrison Villard because she had her house at the very top of Villard Street where they had the best view. She uh, is an amazing woman, again, from the Boston area. She, her father was the most, really the most famous ab white abolitionist. It was, um, um, William Lloyd Garrison. He was outspoken against slavery. In fact, one time he was chased through the streets of Boston by an angry mob who was out to get him because the, what he was advocating for, the end of slavery was so controversial, so contentious at the time. So she grew up in a very reform-minded household and she fell in love with a journalist. She fell in love with a journalist who was reporting about the Civil War his name was Henry Villard. She married him when he was, oh, that's her with her father. I love that picture. William Lord Garrison and his daughter, Fanny. But there's her husband, Henry Villard. When she met him, he wanted to be a journalist. And then he got other ideas. He was very scientifically minded and he knew Einstein. I mean, not Einstein, Edison, excuse me. He invested in Edison's, um, research, and he became very interested in railway fi railroad finance, and he invested in the railways, and he became the head of the Pacific Rail Railways. He became phenomenally wealthy, phenomenally wealthy off of his investments, his financial dealings, his, um, his prescience in understanding what was coming with regard to technology and where the money would be. Anyway, he died at age 65 and left his wife all their money um, it went to her. This is the Villard houses in Manhattan. I show it because many of you will have walked by it often. I've probably walked by it hundreds of times. It's on Madison between 50th and 51st, I think. It was their Manhattan home. There were six houses in that complex. Theirs was one of them. There it is around Christmas time. At one time it was owned by Leona Helmsley and now I think it's owned by the Sultan of Brunei. Um, and it's, I think it's still a hotel, but anyway, gorgeous, gorgeous. But here in Westchester in Dobbs Ferry, oh, it must be Dobbs, not Hastings, Villard Avenue. I'm not sure. Maybe when you get up there, you're on the border between Dobbs and Hastings. But this was one of the houses that they took over. There were two houses owned by two brothers at the top of the hill. And they had a, they tore them down and had another house that I don't have a picture of, but it was a vast estate, very opulent. Fanny Villard gave money to all kinds of good causes. 
And when she died, her sons took it over. And then after a couple of years, they couldn't maintain it. They sold it. It was all torn down. And now it's a bunch of lovely old houses there at the top of what used to be called Villard Hill. And Fanny Villard also spoke in public. And I have her speech. One, only one of her speeches, it's a, it's a tribute um, to Henry Blackwell, but I'm sure she gave other speeches and I'm gonna keep looking for them. So she's another woman who used her voices, her voice for reform. She was one of the founders of what later became the NAACP. Inez Milholland, okay. She's also become very well known just in recent years because she was the face of suffrage, the suffrage movement because she was known as a great beauty and because she could ride a horse because <laughs> she was very eloquent. She made beautiful speeches and there she is as a young woman and she rode the white horse at the head of the very famous suffrage parade in New York City in 1913, the day before the inauguration of um, Woodrow Wilson. She had also ridden a horse in the New York suffrage parade for a couple of years, a brown horse, and then she rode a white horse at several. Anyway, this was her big, this was the one that made her famous. She became the icon of the suffrage movement, but she also was an ardent speaker as she had been when she, she was a student at Vassar. She was a, in the debate club. She took her fellow students out to the woods to debate women's suffrage because she wasn't allowed to debate it on campus at Vassar. So Inez Melholland, a lawyer, who she went to NYU at a time when very few women were getting law degrees and very few institutions were allowing women to go to law school. And here's what she did right here in our backyard. She was part of a investigation into Sing Sing, into abuses at Sing Sing, another Sing Sing connection. Severe condemnation, unfit for animals. She went in, it was a grand jury investigation. She went in and using her law expertise, she interviewed inmates. She was insisted on going alone and being in a cell alone with the male prisoners. In fact, she, at one point she handcuffed herself to another male prisoner because she wanted to no one to come in and take her away because it was quite um, unheard of for a woman to do that. And her information contributed to this grand jury report that got the warden and other people kicked out of their jobs. I mean, they got the cahoots because they were uh, skimming money and also doing a terrible job, um, maintaining very inhumane conditions. So Inez Melholland, the, the rest of her story is one that's admirable and tragic. She took part in this grand movement of, of suffrage campaigners to the West to advocate for um, against Woodrow Wilson and the Democratic Party because they weren't supporting the women's vote. Everywhere she went, people said she's beautiful, she's handsome, she hated it. She said, I want to be known for my brains, for my ideas. They didn't pay her any attention. Anyway, this is a map showing where all the suffrage speakers went out west. You can see the various journeys, the routes they took. That's Alice Paul. She was the brainstormer, the one who came up with this idea. Inez Melholland, let me go back. Inez Melholland went to Los Angeles. It was 19, I think it was 1916. She was not well. She got up on the stage to give a speech. She'd been speaking for two months straight. She spoke at Blanchard Hall in Los Angeles. And the last words she said were, um, Mr. President, when will you give us liberty? And with that, she collapsed on the stage. And she was taken to a hospital and she died a month later. She was, she had, um, pernicious anemia. So she was considered a martyr for the cause of suffrage and she forevermore would be associated with the suffrage cause and the silent sentinels, the women who stood outside the White House would say, Mr. President, how long must we make, wait for liberty um, in homage to Inez? So she's, um, I bring her up here because of her connections to, to Sing Sing. Crystal East contemporaneous, another woman who uh, went to law school and got her law degree. I don't know if she actually knew Inez Melholland, but they travel in some of the same circles. Crystal was part of this group of leftists and radicals who gathered around Mabel, Ma Mabel Dodge Lewin, who had a salon in Manhattan and Greenwich Village, but also up in Croton. 
Now it's a bit controversial, I know, but I will consider Croton one of the river towns because it is on the river. And up in Croton, there were radicals, liberals, leftists, crystals, brother Max Eastman who published The Masses, John Reed, who wrote, um, who went to this, who went to Russia and wrote Seven Days That Shook the World, all kinds of leftists who gathered there at Finney Farm and also around Maple Dodge Lewin up on Mount Airy Road. Crystal Eastman was a forceful speaker and she took part in the Pittsburgh survey. It was a landmark survey funded by the Russell Sage Foundation. The Russell Sage Foundation was again run by a woman who had inherited money from her husband and put it at her husband who was a he was really a um, financier, a railway financier, an associate of, um, of Jay Gould. And anyway, he died, left her all his money. She put it to good use, scattered her money everywhere uh, for good causes, including a groundbreaking sociological survey that sent sociologists and researchers out to survey workers. And Crystal Eastman, had a sociology degree in addition to her law degree and she was sent to Pittsburgh where there were workers. Pittsburgh was steel, obviously we know about US steel, railroads, other heavy industries and she went out and interviewed them. How many hours were they working? How many days a week? What were the conditions? How much were they paid? You know, all kinds of questions. And she published work accidents in the law. There were six volumes of the Pittsburgh survey, hers was without doubt, the most influential and groundbreaking. This was the, the publication. This is just an example of kind of work she did. Death calendar in industry for Allegheny County. All the red marks are men killed at work who died. And of course, when a worker died, he got no workers comp. So Crystal Eastman, then went and served on a New York State Commission to draft the nation's first workers' comp law. And then she went around and spoke about it. August 9th in Geneva, New York, she, and she spoke everywhere about workers' comp and the need for um, protection for workers because when a worker got injured or died, his family was left completely bereft. So this was in the uh, beginnings of the progressive era when workers' law was so was so and was so critical and so many people were advocating it for it. Isadora Duncan, the great dancer, the introducer of modernism and dance. This is the um, is the barn. It's a ruin that it's still standing up in the Finney Farm area in Croton where her sister Elizabeth had a dance school. Isadora danced down at Scarborough. She danced, she lived in Yonkers for a while. She danced for wealthy people in the homes of wealthy people over in the other part of the county in Rye. She was all over Westchester dancing while her sister ran her dance school in, um, up in Croton. And Isadora Duncan spoke often about dance as a modernist expression. She, you can find five or six of her speeches in my archive. This is a speech she gave, I think in 1913 at the Berlin Press Association. Der Tanz der Zukunft, ignore my German accent, please. But it means um, the dance of the future where she laid out her revolutionary ideas about movement and as an art form, as a new art form that shouldn't be constrained, that human body should be free and expressive and in, and in concert with nature. So Isadora Duncan used her, her body, but also her voice. Madam C.J. Walker, of course, we all know who she was. She was a local hero. She came up with um, potions and lotions for black women to treat black women's hair. She maintained she could grow hair. And up in the left is a picture of her shack where she was born in Louisiana. And we all know this picture in the lower right. This is her home, which is still standing within walking distance of us. Uh, where me, where I am in Irvington, the Villa Lawaro. Here's a picture I found. I love this picture because everybody in the picture looks like is black. This is the front of the house. <laughs> this is the back of the house. She must have had a convention there, some sort of convention or gathering. And 
here it is today. I'll go back so you can see here it was then, here it is today. Now, for the longest time, I couldn't find any speeches and I just assumed that she didn't speak. And then just recently, I found two speeches by her at a Black business entrepreneurs conference. Two, two years in a row, she, she spoke at the invitation of um, Du Bois. So again, a woman who used her voice. Doris Stevens, another one of those, she was another one of the Croton people, the Croton radicals and a suffragist. Here she is on the right-hand side, a silent sentinel uh, standing in protests outside the White House, jailed for freedom was the book she wrote. She was thrown into jail. Just a picture of Mabel Dodge Lewin. She's the only woman I do not have a uh, speech by. I know she must have given them. I just haven't found them. But she started in Greenwich Village the, what we think of as the first open mic session. <laughs> in her home, in, she had an open mic. Anybody could come up and speak about, she believed speech was the most powerful form of expression and people would speak about women's rights, about race issues, about anarchism, about politics. Anything and everything could be spoken about at Mabel Dodge Lewin's home. There's another picture of her. And Louise Bryant was in her circle. Louise Bryant, we all know from the movie Reds. And I recently found her testimony uh, before Congress at the Overman Committee. It was in right after the Russian Revolution when Congress was worried about Bolshevism and radicalism in the United States. Margaret Sanger, uh, another person who hung out in the Greenwich Village scene. She has several connections to Westchester. She studied nursing at White Plains Hospital. She lived in Yonkers for a while, and she also lived in Hastings. That was her house on the right. She was married, and she had two children, and she hated the suburbs. She was bored out of her mind. And she went right back to the city and got divorced and um, started birth control clinic. She became um, focused on the issue of making birth control accessible. There's her first clinic in Brooklyn. Of course, just two days ago, I think, or three days ago, the head of Planned, Parent, Planned Parenthood glo um, globally came out and said, we are dissociating ourselves from Margaret Sanger because she was a eugenicist and she associated herself with racists. Um, but we cannot tell the story of women's reproductive rights without Margaret Sanger. And she used her voice at a time when there was great risk for doing so. She was jailed eight different times. And one, at one point she left the United States for a year and a half and went to live in England to avoid being in jail. There she is getting arrested. So she was, astonishingly brave to, to use her voice. There she is, Carnegie Hall, 1917, speaking out for birth control. Carrie Chapman Catt took over from Susan B. Anthony as head of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. She served two terms and she was president at the time when women were granted the vote in 1919. Um, Briar, Briarcliff Manor, that was her home, Juniper Ledge. I drove up there about a year ago. It's about 20 minutes by car, the house is still there. The current owners were very gracious. Of course, I stayed at socially distanced, but I spoke to them on the lawn. You can find the house yourself easily. That's where she lived with her. She was a widow twice, then she had a female partner. That's where she lived with her female partner. And then towards the end of her life, she moved across the county to New Rochelle. There she is at the end of her life. So here's my question. I've gotten to the end of, pretty much to the end of my talk. Westchester County, a little county in a big state, one state in a big nation. Why so many powerful women speakers? It took a lot of moxie to go against the zeitgeist, right? And to speak out for unpopular causes. Why do we have so many examples of powerful women speakers in Westchester County? I'll offer a few ideas and then I'd like to open it up to, the, to you and see what your thoughts are. One is obviously we are in the orbit of New York City and great cities, big cities are cauldrons of ideas. And um, our community is a satellite city, of course, less so back then, people weren't commuting every day into the city, but those ideas obviously spilled over. Education, P 
people were highly educated and money. People had the resources to be educated. Not everybody. We know there's a lot of poverty, even in our backyard. But there was enough um, education, value of education. Some of the early people I talk about were educated up at Emma Willard's School for Girls up in Troy. And some of them went to Vassar, which was the first women's school, which is just up the river, also a river town in a sense in, in Poughkeepsie. So the other, the other last thing that I'll throw into the hopper is the Mabel Dodge Lewin idea, which is that critical creative community. People came together to share their ideas as they do to this day, as we're doing right now, coming together to share our ideas. And I think all of those are key factors for creative ferment, for the generation of new ideas and for emboldening people to be, to be brave enough and outspoken enough to share their ideas. So I will end with this question. What does a powerful woman look, woman speaker look like? You all saw the image that I started with Cicero. We know that was a man. What does a powerful woman speaker look like today? Well, after this session, I hope you will all go to a mirror and look in the mirror because a powerful woman speaker looks like you looks like all of us, because all of us can be powerful speakers speaking out on whatever it is that we believe in, whatever cause we want to advance. I, um, I'll be there to support you. I'm Donna Rubin. Please look at my speakingwellfemale.co, not .com, .co speech bank. There's my email if you want to get in touch with me. And I'm going to stop my screen share now and open it up to anybody who wants to contribute. Thank you so much, Donna. So let's see, uh, we have a note in the chat from Martina saying, sorry, I have to leave early, but this was a fascinating and interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, Wonderful. Okay, so I mean, I'm interested in your thoughts really. Obviously the world has changed a lot. Now we have the internet. We, anybody can go on the internet and access all the lead, all ideas from all over the world. We can all get on Zoom calls. Maybe it's not so important to be in a big city anymore or in the, in the outskirts of a big city. Um, I don't know. I welcome the changes. I think it's, it's great that we can all communicate with people all around the world. That is to say anywhere that people have the free internet because there are a lot of places in the world where people can't get access to the free internet, right? China for one. Um, millions of women in China can't get access to the ideas, the ideas that we're talking about today. I would really appreciate it if one of you would say something to join in our conversation. I'm just wondering, in now that you mention people in other countries, are, are there Japanese women, for example, who are outspoken? There are, in fact, Laura, you may remember this brouhaha just about a month ago when the head of the um, Olympic Committee mm. had to step down because in a meeting he made this comment. He said, um, we don't want to put too many women on the board because they'll be talking too much. And women, <laughs> you know, <laughs> women talk too much. And if you get one, they'll get a bunch of them and they'll be, take over the meeting. And anyway, he was brought down. It took a week for him to, he said, I will not resign. It took a week. For him to resign and the reason he resigned is because a young japanese woman started a petition i think she was 19 year old 19 years old she was a college student mm -hmm. she started a petition and said get let's get let's get rid of this guy he had been he, toshiro mori he had been the prime minister of japan yeah I so yes are there as many no but are there some yes and you know i have a lot of encouragement for the new generations, younger women are more outspoken. A lot of these things just take time. That's why we have to keep pushing these ideas. And that's why I feel like I wanna keep speaking out about this. And also I am publishing one, maybe two, maybe three anthologies of women's speeches. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. And when I, and when I do that, that'll be a platform for me to be able to speak more about women's voices, the history of women's voices and encourage young women to speak up. Yeah. But it does take time. It's the work of generations of our children, our children's children. But in the same way, it's, it makes, it's very moving to me. You can find in a lot of these speeches, women talking about the fact that 
they were doing the work for women to come. I mean, a lot of the women who espoused these causes did not see their causes come to, the fr to fruition. The early advocates of abolition, the early advocates of women's, the vote for women, they died before they saw that come to pass. Mm -hmm. One exception was Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger lived to an old age and she saw the fruits of all of her work come to pass. But most, you know, most advocates who, whose ideas are really far in the future don't see the full expression, the full fruition of their ideas. So we have to believe that we are planting seeds for the future. Well, I think we probably are, not we, you and many of these other, other women. Um, I worry about, and it's gonna sound so old fashioned, but a lot of younger people are not very articulate. Uh, I'm, I've got three daughters and, and I can tell you that they're, they've got passion about a lot of public uh, issues, but they're, they're not always such great speakers. Um, last night, there we, we have a, this group of River Towns Episcopal churches, but it's other churches too, that get together monthly to talk about racial problems and, um, and what work we have to do. And there were three women speak, featured last night, three women. Um, but by chance, a lot of the time we have men speakers and they were all from around here and each one smarter than the next. Our own Sarah Cox did a terrific job. Um, Sarah Cox, who does a lot of public speaking. Oh, she does a lot of public speaking. So she has a lot of experience. Well, she does it so well. And uh, I'm really admiring of anybody who can who's got a lot of knowledge, a lot of thoughts, but can't always get them out because it's it's something that needs practice and women are not encouraged to practice that. I thought those tools of early, you know, how to treat a nag, how to handle that was just unbelievable. Well, Laura, I want to tell you a, a particular really quick story, which is that when you were sitting there I remember looking at you at my talk at West at mm -hmm. White Plains Library and I was scared to death. I mean, I think it was more than two years ago. I was petrified. My heart was beating fast. So I teach public speaking. I teach self-advocacy and thought leadership. And what I teach is that if you want to get better at it, you got to do it. So like I said, I'm seeing you here at the beginning and at the end of this particular tour. And I've gotten so much more comfortable speaking about it because I'm familiar with the material. So that has to be part of the message that we give to young women is the more you do it, the better you will be. Speak and more as you said, you are uh, now completely on top of your material. Um, and that, that makes a big difference. Somehow- And men also the other thing that I always teach is know your material, know it cold. Because the more familiar you are with your material, the more comfortable you will be expressing it. But I completely agree. I'm so glad you said that. And that's, that is why I teach those, lead those workshops and teach those skills because I do want to make sure that um, young women and middle-aged women <laughs> and older women <laughs> use their voices. It was so informative. Uh, Donna, I have a question myself. Uh, nowadays, one issue that we very frequently see with public speakers, uh, women speaking in public, is that in online spaces, especially uh, video uh, such as YouTube, TikTok, streaming video sites, we see women who will make public statements ranging from very innocuous to highly charged topics who are then harassed and talked down to by male audience members to the point that they wind up being deplatformed just because of the tremendous outcry. Did you find evidence that there were similar things happening to the speakers that you discussed earlier in the presentation? Uh, in, uh, in their own platforms back in that time? You know what, I heard everything you said, but I think it's because you're wearing a mask. Ask, I, I want to speak about what you're talking about, the violence and abuse towards women. It is terrible. But what is the exact question? I want to make sure I answer it. So 
very often in online spaces, we see women yeah. being pushed out of those spaces by especially uh, male opponents of their speech, often simply for daring to be a woman speaking in public. And I was wondering if you saw a lot of evidence of the same thing happening back then before uh, the internet. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Women have been vilified from the beginning of time when they've been speaking. Absolutely. Now, this phenomenon of online abuse is, an, is a new phenomenon because our online media is new, but women have been disparaged. Women have had fruit thrown at them. They've had, there's a story that um, Sojourner Truth used to be, powerful women spoke like Sojourner Truth. Men would call out in the audience, are you a man? You know, because it was considered emasculating for a woman to speak in public. So one time, Sojourner Truth just calmly ripped her blouse open. <laughs> and, and there's also a story about Lucy Stone. One time she was speaking and they broke a window and threw cold water over her head. And according to her daughter, who wrote the story, she just went right on speaking. But they have had, women have had fruit thrown at them. They've been called all sorts of horrible names just because they were women speaking, because it's, it's a threat. A powerful woman is a threat. Now, I do want to make one more, tell you one more quick little story, which is that I keep finding these speeches, putting them on the site, finding more speeches, putting them on the site. Eventually, the categories, I've broken it into, I had 33 categories, and they get so full, they're unwieldy. So then I have to come up with more categories to break them down to get the information easier to access. And I just created three new categories. One is called Radicals and Revolutionaries. And I put, put in some of the women that we talked about today and, and Emma Goldman. And, and one of them was called, I think, I can't remember, one of them's called Marriage and Divorce. But anyway, one of them's called Violence and Abuse. Now, it pains me that I had to make a whole category called Violence and Abuse, but into that category, I put all kinds of women speaking about the abuse and violence that women experience. And several of those features are women involved in online campaigns. Mm -hmm. Um, including the Gamergate. Gamergate was a very famous episode a few years ago when women who were involved in the online gaming industry were harassed is not even the word. I mean, yeah. they were just basically chased <laughs> off the platform. And Anita Sarkeesian and several other women are in that violence and abuse section talking about. And now there's a, talking about that. And now there's a new movement by women to take over that platform and make it a safe one for women's voices. Hmm. But no, so the answer is yes, it's been going on forever. And yes, it's still going on, sadly. So that's why you have to really have the moxie. You really have to have the knowledge. You have to have the expertise. You have to have the comfort of speaking to speak up because it is still not easy. It's still any, hard. Any of these speakers, do you get a sense that their audiences are, um, are, include many men, not as harassers, but just. Well, yeah, absolutely. It just depends on, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it depends on where, what's the venue where they're speaking, but are you talking about in the past? Or are you talking about now? Uh, I'm talking about in the past and now. Well, originally in the past, in the past, so in, Amer in America and in, in Western Europe, women in the, in the 18th century, 1700s, there were women who spoke, not many, but there were some, and they could speak to all audiences. But then in the early 19th century, this idea of promiscuous audiences arose, a promiscuous audience didn't have anything to do with promiscuity in the sense yeah, yeah. that we know it. It was a mixture of men and women. So women were supposed to speak to women and men were supposed to speak to men. And a woman who spoke promiscuously was a woman who spoke to audiences with men and women. And, um, oh my goodness, there were Fanny Wright. Fanny Wright spoke promiscuously and this whole movement against her Fanny Wrightism arose. And there were images of Fanny Wright with a duck's head as a gabbling. I and mean, Fanny Wright was one of the, she spoke in the 1830s and 40s and even beyond that here in New York. She was from Scotland, but she came and made her home here. And the abuse was terrible, but, but she spoke to promiscuous audiences. And then through the civil war and into the suffrage era, we see more women speaking to men, men and women. By the end of the 19th century, we we're past that. But the beginning of the 19th century, this idea really held that men had their sphere, women had their sphere, and that included audiences for public speaking. 
We have such a long way to go. <laughs> we have such a long way to go. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Kashet. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Laura. And I hope that we'll all have the chance to talk about all these things and more in a newly opened up world. Oh, God, I hope. Donna, th and thank you. And thank you for all your research. I know how hard you've worked on this. I I'd love to hear more about how you've done that and all the different segments and stuff. I know it's probably like just going down a web and unfortunately it wasn't a World Wide web back then, but you had to figure out your own, your own web and, and, and just keep digging and searching, but it, it's such a treasure to have. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And it was a and I hope you're me. also capturing all the voices that are now pertinent so that the next generation will all have, have that also. And they won't have to dig so hard because you've done it for them. You're paving the way. I happen to know that Sherry has grandsons. And I will say this, that I don't do this work just for our daughters and our granddaughters. I also do it for the sons and grandsons because we want a world in which men too grow up recognizing that all voices are equal yeah. and that women's voices matter just as much as men's voices. So the work is not just for our granddaughters, it's for our grandsons too. For everybody, the world. world. All right, you go girl. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye all. Thank you, Kishet. Uh, thank you. So unless there's any final comments, oh, that's it from everyone. So I'm going to shut the recording here.